So my topic for today is GD pause. So what is GD pause? It was a term which was first coined by Dr. Eskin in 2003. It's defined as a phase of menopause after 65 years. And it's divided into early and late GD pause. So 65 years onwards is early and late is 80 years onwards. So why is GD pause suddenly the talk of the town? Well, that's because the life expectancy overall has increased all over the world. In India, the average life expectancy right now is 68 years. And according to the United Nations population, between 2010 and 2050, all, uh, uh, 65 years and above population will probably increase from 5% to 14. And the above 80 years population would probably triple from 1% to 30%. So these are all the things that occur during normal aging. This increases the population's vulnerability, but does not increase their illness. There are various endocrinological changes that occur after the age of 65 from estrogen levels going as low as uh, less than five, increased TSH, decrease in the androgens, and um, the estradiol before there's a small raise and then a drop. And interestingly, the FSH levels, there's a raise in early menopause, but it, there's a fallback in late menopause. As a result, we have many changes that occur in the body. These are a few listed. So there was a study done in 2017, which studied the gynec disorders in geriatric women in India. And over 100 women were studied over the age of 65. Majority of them were known to have gentle tract malignancies, almost 32%, followed by the pelvic organ prolapse and urogenital infection. So coming to some of the life-threatening disorders in this population. Breast cancer is the commonest cancer in India currently, 30% of which is uh, more than 70 years population, and it's more challenging in this population. So in healthy older women, it's a normal course of treatment. In frail elderly, surgery followed by endocrine therapy, and in case of unfit or refuse, then primary endocrine therapy is the way to go. Cervical cancer being the second commonest, Almost half the invasive cancers have not had a pap in three years, usually in the older age group. So screening is the most important thing. If you see most of the societies, organizations, all have screening up to the age of 65 or 70. And it's very important that if there are any risk factors to go beyond that as well. In case of ovarian cancer, there's a lifetime risk of one in 70. And half, more than half of the ovarian cancers occur in women are uh, more than 65 years. It peaks at the seventh decade and elevates up to the age of 80. And a good examination assist and assessment is of utmost importance. Coming to endometrial cancer, 90% of them present as a postmenopausal bleeding. And transvaginal ultrasonography is of utmost importance for, to uh, estimate the uh, endometrial thickness and uh, see any pathology. And hysteroscopy biopsy is the way to go to assess as to why there is postmenopausal bleeding. And in case the patient is using any unopposed estrogen therapy or tamoxifen, it requires proper endometrial surveillance. Bulbal cancer constitutes about 4% of gynae cancers in India. It usually occurs in the postmenopausal population and peak incidence between the seventh and eighth decade. Early stages, surgical excision is more than enough, and later stages along with chemo radiation. Coming to the disorders that affect the quality of life in this population. So when it, these are the various vulval um, disorders that can occur. And these, uh, these are some of the vaginal disorders that are listed out here. Coming to the most important one, atrophic vaginitis. Almost 45% of the geripausal patients have atrophic vaginitis. And this occurs because of the thinning of the vaginal mucosa and alkalization of the vaginal fluid, causing a decrease in the lactobacilli. So this increases chance of infections overall, and especially urinary tract infections. This can be sorted with topical estrogen, if appropriate for that patient. 
uterine prolapse is more than 65 years are the fastest growing segment currently. And management can be by expectant, pelvic floor exercises, biofeedback, electrical stimulation of the pelvic floor, pessaries, surgical treatment as last resort, and topical estrogen to prevent any sort of infection. Urogenital atrophy. So why did this happen? Because of the thinning of the vaginal mucosa and urinary tract structural changes such as strictures and diverticula. This in turn increases the urinary tract infections, incontinence, frequency, urgency, recurrent cystitis, and urethral caruncles. HRT in no way has pro proven to help these symptoms. In fact, in the WHI trial in 2002, it proved otherwise. Urinary incontinence. The, cause, the reason it's so much in this uh, population is because of the reduced bladder capacity, increased residual urine, reduced pelvic floor muscle strength, and degeneration of the detrusa muscles. So this really threatens the quality of life in terms of isolation, depression, dehydration, and otherwise as well presents as unitract infections, urosepsis, and decupitous ulcers. So how do we treat this? Atrophies by estrogen cream and vaginal rings, incontinence by modes of estrogen cream, pelvic floor exercises, pessary, bladder training, surgery if required, and antibiotics in terms of recurrent UTIs. So we all think that vasomotor symptoms all stop, um, you know, once the early menopause is over. But in fact, nine to sixteen percent of the women continue to have menopausal symptoms as uh, beyond sixty-five years and 10% beyond 70 years. And only 13.7% of these women actually are on a mode of treatment. There was a study done in Australia, which assessed the vasomotor and sexual symptoms that occurred in this population. 1,548 women were taken and between the age of 65 and 79, and at least one had a vasomotor symptom of, uh, at least one vasomotor symptom in 32.8% of this population. So how do we sort this? This is by dressing in layers, a cooler environment, avoiding caffeine, hot and spicy food, quit smoking, vaginal moisturizers, things such as yoga and acupuncture, exercise, all re reduce the symptom duration, but do not reduce the symptoms as such. And complement therapies have mixed reviews because they are not FDA approved and dosage is not well regulated. So the safety is not very well known. Drugs such as clonidin and gabapentin in the geripausal population risk outweighs the benefit. So the North American Menopause Society on HRT in this geripausal population said, long-term use is not, cannot be used to prevent chronic disease and it's not advisable. When being used is not required to be stopped abruptly due to the age alone. And if started later on in the menopause, the risks outweigh the benefits. And if more than 65 years and on hormonal therapy for more than five years, it should be reassessed and check for new risk factors. And even if they're stopped, stop by slow tapering method or change to transdermal and vaginal estrogen. This again is a tabular column of the possible methods of treatment. So it's all about, it's not about one size fits all. It has to be individualized treatment tailor made for each individual. Osteoporosis, regular DEXA scanning is of utmost importance and it can be treated by method of diet, calcium and vitamin D intake, bisphosphonates, calcitonin and raloxifen. Sarcopenia is something that is uh, really been talked about in the recent times. And the best way to, um, you know, fight this would be exercise and nutrition. There are some, um, you know, medications that can be used, like testosterone, selective androgen receptors, statins, AC inhibitors, but there's still ongoing, uh, you know, studies to find a good efficacious drug. Cardiovascular risk is high in this uh, population, and the use of hormonal therapy for this prevention is a big no. In fact, antihypertensives and statins have a greater risk reduction. Cognitive dysfunction, cognitive, cognitive dysfunction and dementia increase the incident rate uh, in 70 to 80 years. 
and treating reversible causes like medication, like benzodiazepines, hypertension, depression, all of these are good ways to treat it. And other lifestyle remedies such as diet modification, exercise, social engagement, in intellectual stimulation, all this helps. So how do we have a good GD pause? Healthier lifestyles, good nutritional status, physical activity, regular risk assessments, good screening techniques in this population. And we really require guidelines in this population, HRT if appropriate, and non-hormonal methods otherwise. So my take home messages would be, patient need individualized treatment. It has to be tailor-made to each person and integrated interdisciplinary work. Promotive and preventive approaches are as important as the curative approach. Dedicated geriatric clinics and approach to these uh, geripausal patients. A fun fact is there was a Dr. Manuel uh, from Portugal, who is actually the medical director of the Portugal Menopause Society. He rejected this word geripause in the North American yeah, Menopause can you Society. Can summarize? It is getting delayed, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, he, uh, he actually, um, you know, rejected this word and instead proposed a word called geriaki, meaning similar to menarche, meaning the beginning of old age. Thank you.